Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Brooke Berlin. I obviously know all of you since you're joining us today. I'm absolutely just thrilled to be joined by such an amazing grouping of people today. Delphine King, who is the director of The Long Run, and then Louise Cotter, who sits on the board of The Long Run and is also one of the owners of Cotter's in uh, Kenya. And Cotter's is a global ecosphere retreat within The Long Run. And then Stefan Bruckner, the owner of Volvedons down in Namibia, also a global ecosphere retreat. And then Russell Banks from Swalu in South Africa, I think one of the newest members of the long run. Um, and of course, for me, I'm beyond honored because I get to work hand in hand with both Louise and Russell. Um, so that's a little bit of me and why I'm moderating today. With that, I am going to quickly play a video intro of the long run. I have all of my sound turned up loud. So if it's soft on your side, please just turn your sound up a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna try and make this as smooth as possible for us. a global alliance of like-minded individuals that all run nature-based businesses that are trying to have a positive impact from a environmental and social and cultural point of view. What unites the long run members is that they all are looking after an important chunk of biodiversity that needs preserving. They're all embedded in a local community and they all think that culture is a very important ingredient in their businesses. The idea of the long run is really to, to, to grow its footprint around the world. We want to preserve 20 million acres by 2020 and affect 2 million lives positively with the long run members that are operating around the world. The long run is all about using the framework of the four C's of conservation, community, culture and commerce to really manage your land or your water in a holistic way. Four C's is just a great structure to introduce a wee bit of discipline to what you're doing. You know, it gives you something to set targets, to measure yourself against. You know, that's really important if sustainability is going to be about more than, more than words and it, about action and, and results at the end of it. One of the things that really attracted us to the long run was the name. We are in this for the long run. It's not all about profit. It's about the people and it's about the place. The long run is also about sharing. Uh, we can every day learn how to make things better and all of those members of the long run, they're you know, operating on the ground on a daily basis. We share best practice and that helps all of us to get better in the future. Last year we went to the Long Run's annual general meeting at Group Boss in South Africa, which was a huge eye-opener to us, simply because it was an excellent way for us to get access to a number of people whose interests are very much on the same platform as ours. The Long Run brings people together that all share the same passion for the environment and for their communities and for the culture that they are embedded in and uh, want to make the world a better place and make sure that we can preserve nature while we are creating win-win situations for nature and people. We all have goals that we want to accomplish, but it's not something that you can accomplish in a year or two. We all have a very long time horizon in mind and sometimes think from generation to next generation. And I think that's what makes the long run unique because you're setting your business up truly for the long run. All right, fantastic. So Delphine, over to you, please, to introduce us all a little bit to the long run, the four C's, and why we're all here today. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you for organizing this event. Um, I'd love to share my screen. I just gave you permission. <laughs> There's always okay. something wrong with my tech, I promise. <laughs> That's a good Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, okay. Tell me if you see everything. 
Um, yeah, so the little, you know, the, the little uh, film will have given you all a, a bit of an inkling of what the long run is about. So I'll just briefly set the scene because I think what's most important is to hear from our members how being part of our community is, has shaped their journey and, and how it's shaping their guests' journey. So basically, the long run is a global network of uh, primarily uh, properties that own, manage, or influence uh, biodiversity. So um, it's a it's a, a charitable organisation. We're based in in uh, UK now, but we started. We were founded by Jochen Zeit and nine founding members, including Volvidence, who's talking uh, a, a bit after me. Um, and we were founded 12 years ago with the idea of uh, bringing together best practice, incredible uh, passion, uh, and bringing together like-minded people who seek to create positive impacts through their business, but basically with a mission of conserving biodiversity. Uh, and understanding that to do that, we need to have a, a, a sustainability framework that's looking differently at how we do business. Um, so bringing, you know, bringing all these passionate people together, um, what we do together is really we support and we connect uh, this community of people to learn from each other, inspire each other, challenge each other to, other to push boundaries uh, in the realm of sustainability. And the idea is really to create and demonstrate um, uh, how far we can go if we change our mindset, how far we can go, you know, what are the realms of possibility if we put our mind to it in terms of driving positive change through business. Um, so there's two, there's three or four, two or three, sorry, principles in the long run, you know, important pil pillars of the long run. One is collaboration. So the idea is really about collective action and, and understanding that collaborating um, and sharing knowledge is the way to get scale and to address, you know, the challenges that we're facing today, the environmental challenges and social challenges. Um, the other, the other important pillar is the idea of a journey. We're never going to get there, so it's a commitment to continuously improve, to continuously push the boundaries, to continuously uh, 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 expand our positive impact, not only within our properties but outside. Um, the other pillar is the Four Cs framework, and you've heard about it uh, in the in the movie, in the movie, in the film, uh, and and you will hear a lot about it uh, through our members. But basically, the Four Cs framework is, is, um, is a tangible way uh, to help members embed sustainability, sustainable thinking and holistic thinking in their business and, and their projects, really, uh, recognizing that to have a truly viable business, to have a truly viable planet, we need to have its dimensions uh, in balance. Um, the, the final pillar is the Global Ecosphere Retreat, so standard. Um, so it's a standard recognized by GSTC, and the idea of the standard was really a milestone, a, a, a milestone in the journey um, of our members to celebrate uh, a, an, achieve, an achievement in the balance of the four Cs. But it's not the end of the journey, it's part of the journey. So I think you will hear that also through, through, through the discussions that we have afterwards. Um, but the idea is that global ecosphere retreats are centers of excellence and, and demonstrate, again, what is possible when we think differently. Um, so we started as a program of Zeitz Foundation and, and then became a charity. And then we've joined forces recently with, with another not-for-profit to strengthen you know, what we, how we can support our members, uh, but also to make sure that as we grow, we continue uh, being mission focused and, and credible and rigorous. Um, so collectively, our members to showcase what we can do, you know, together, um, uh, our members now protect 23 million acres of land. They impact the lives of 750,000 uh, people and they protect uh, 30,000 species and 300 endangered species. But again, just to show the scale at which we can operate from large to small properties, but together we're making an impact. Um, so there's three, you know, members, properties become uh, fellow members. Um, so they enter as fellow members. 
they aspire to become global lake spear retreats, they commit to that journey, and we commit to supporting them on that journey by connecting them to others, learning and sharing and reflecting and taking stock and strategically reflect and reflect. And recently, we've opened the membership to travel partners who are uh, travel designers, travel agents, tour operators who are who want to engage uh, in 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 that sustainability movement. Um, but and for us, we we welcome them with the idea that they're really the linchpin between consumers, guests who now really want to find impactful way to travel, and the members of the long run who are doing incredible work driving positive change uh, in in landscapes all around the world. So over to the members to tell you how does that shape um, in at the destination. And I'm stopping sharing right away. <laughs> Thank you, Delphine, uh, and also Brooke for organizing it. Um, and of course, for everyone that's listening in today, we really, really appreciate your, your engagement and interest in, in the long run. So just a, a little background about Cotters. Uh, we're a small family-run business in the Maasai Mara in, in, in Kenya. Uh, 15 years ago, we were a regular camp in the Mara without much of a, a conservation vision or narrative uh, and not doing so much. And there are many properties like that, as, as we all know, in the Maasai Mara. Um, but we decided to really try and strive to be a better organization. And that's why we joined the long run. And um, they helped us with our strategic vision and our journey and it's a, a continuing journey um, and we we worked incredibly hard towards that so my presentation my today is around three components one is around the elements that the long run has helped us in terms of our impact the other is how the long run process uh, has, has helped us improve customer experience and then the last one is again how the long run process has helped us improve credibility. So um, we, we're a family that have been in business for 100 years, but we really needed to look at what happens in the next 100 years and can we plan that long ahead and how do we get there in bite-sized sort of five-year pieces um, and what is that vision and what can we meaningfully do to not only make a difference in our little sphere and in our little business, but what can we do that makes us stand out globally? And so we joined as a member, but we are aiming to become that distinct global ecosphere, which does show the attributes of, of uh, destinations and, and, and properties that are really, really making a difference at the global scale. And for us, it was working with the community to develop conservances that are held in perpetuity by the community. And, and, and to try and find ways to protect key migratory corridors, particularly for elephants um, from the Maasai Mara going outwards um, from the Mara. And that was our, our vision along with phenomenal local community guiding and bringing those guides up uh, by having a school and working over 15 years uh, to have some of the best guides now in the business. There were other, of course, many, many components around culture and, and environmental management and carbon footprint, but those were our key sort of impact uh, components that we strive for. It was an incredibly complicated process. Um, we never did it for market recognition. We did it because we believe we should be doing better. But by doing that, it has brought mar market recognition to us. So in terms of how the long run has helped us improve customer experience, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago, we would have been really chuffed to have been in Vogue and hoped that that would have given us exposure that mattered. And then COVID hit in the last few years, we have really tried to focus on improving the client experience 
that is purposeful for the context, that is engaging, that is dynamic. Uh, and so, frankly, no one cares about vultures globally. Half of the vulture population in the Maasai Mara has been decimated through human poisoning. So we've started focusing on helping vultures. Um, and it's ironic that we have gone from Vogue to vultures, and now Vogue want to speak to us about the work we do on vultures. So I, I think, um, interestingly, the marketplace is coming round to looking at tourism experiences that are marginal sometimes, but are very purposeful. And so our activities, of course, it's the Maasai Mara, we do game drives, we do game walks, but we also do a series of evening talks that are optional on, on, the, on the issues that matter most to the context that we're in. We do a, a, a vulture experience. Um, we have recruited female uh, rangers that the work in our conservancy and our guests can join them for an hour and walk with them and learn their, their sort of experiences of, of having these unusual positions uh, in, the, in the Maasai Mara. We've developed low impact activities such as e-bikes and, and seed ball uh, re reforestation. So really a lot of our activities now, yes, we do game drives, but we also do a lot more that's compelling that's sustainable, that has impact, that has purpose, that clients want to be engaged in. And I believe that with the right story behind it, all of these activities are as compelling as seeing the big five. And so there is a real breadth and depth to the customer experience through sustainability, through culture, through community that we, we offer to our clients at Cotters. In terms of how the process uh, improves credibility, you know, we never did it. We never did it for any market recognition. We never did it because it may help us make a sale. We did it because it was the right thing to do. And I believe slowly over time, the market and, and the supply chain is recognizing that. Uh, and I'm, I, I do hope that as we move forward over the next decade, that's what's going to matter more and more. Certainly the statistics out there are, are showing that nowadays. Um, and, and I think better collaboration with our supply partners, the supply chain will really uh, uh, multiply the effect of this to the marketplace. So the more we work together to try and get these compelling stories out and these compelling, compelling experiences to your clients, the more likely it is that, that you'll get better business from this, we think. So that, that's it from Cotters, just to say a huge thank you for, for listening in today. Rook, uh, I can see you, but I can't hear anything. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Uh, okay. Um, well, Louise, I think that was excellent. Um, I feel it can't be topped um, in terms of the depth and the the you know, the purpose-driven way you are going about reshaping tourism and. Um, <clears throat> Look, yeah, at Volvodance, maybe just quickly. Um, Volvodance is a, is a lodge and camp operation in one of Africa's largest private large landscape conservation areas called the Namibran Nature Reserve. Um, and uh, we've been at it for 25 years. <clears throat> Our 25 year jubilee coincided with the COVID time. So we never had that big party. Um, what we did have, though, is the opportunity to actually go into this beautiful desert and uh, go into a retreat and for a few weeks sort of figure out uh, what's next. And um, I think this COVID disruption is a very potent fertilizer for change, as we all, I think, feel um, there's change on the way, but we all 
don't quite know how it's going to play out. I mean, how the markets, our tourism industry is going to play out. But I think, yeah, Louis sort of made the great introduction because I think it's quite clear to all of us that the way we do tourism and how we conduct it has to change uh, away from passive consumption uh, towards uh, active participation. And um, that sort of, um, I think is what, what long run destinations are, are really striving for is to not only offer the wonderful sunsets and the uh, game drives, but to, to go a bit deeper and, um, and um, you know, sort of offer a more conscious travel experience. So when um, COVID, when it was apparent that COVID is not a short three month disruption, but uh, you know, now we are one year into it and uh, I'm quite convinced, sadly, that we are probably headed for another year of this. Um, what, in which way does tourism evolve after that? And, and the long run um, always served as a wonderful sort of guide with the, with the balance of the four C's, conservation, community, culture, and commerce. And um, I think for me as, as the driver of Volver Dance, um, it became clear that we need to do it sort of um, much more in depth and uh, the outcome of some, some months of retreat in this beautiful arid Eden was that I realized it's so much more than you know running a safari camp in a beautiful landscape. And uh, the outcome was a was a 10-year plan which we theme or called the Arid Eden project. And it's basically our vision for the next 10 years. And it entails uh, a lot of the things that Louise um, mentioned, you know, the way you create your guest experience and that should really move away from just wonderful camps and spectacular sunset spots and bring on the big five. And um, we, and I mentioned it before, we really want to move away from, from this passive consumption, which was the previous paradigm of, of travel um, to, to active participation, and also bring in a much higher level of consciousness, which is why we um, planned a workshop just before COVID uh, themed changing into fifth gear and the fifth gear was actually in our case the fifth C consciousness and what I also decided already before COVID um, is that um, there's not much sense running after profit my, my dad who started this reserve and actually really walked the talk 30 years ago always said remember son your last shirt hasn't got a pocket so what's the point of amassing a fortune if you can't take it with you, whether you go to heaven or hell? So um, I decided, first of all, I want to go to heaven. And secondly, I want to follow in my father's footsteps and make the money work for good so that you can really enjoy it. And that's, that's really what this Herod Eden project is all about. It's, it's really a very holistic, balanced way of conducting your business, uh, balance, in the in the sake of volver dance actually means also very importantly a balance between net profit and whatever we collect uh, through our commercial enterprise in the form of uh, levies conservation levies or foundation levies to um, for doing good and interestingly we introduced that concept three years before COVID and uh, 2017 18 and 19 the monies we collected for doing good that, that were channeled into conservation, community, and culture uh, were double the amount of what we profited after tax. Um, so our business before COVID was a bit out of balance. So we are trying to bring that back. And, and the result of that was what we call our matrix 25. So we've got the five C's, uh, the fifth C, uh, consciousness. Then we've got a number of um, um, diversified business activities because tourism is just one side of it. We are also going into horticulture. We, are, we identified education as a core uh, part of who we are, um, as well as conservation. 
And if you throw all that together, um, there is a wonderful matrix 25 and um, that's got 25 work packages and under every work package, there is um, more work packages. And, and that really is what, what is driving Volvo Dance these days. And, you know, it is not about wonderful safari camps and uh, golden taps and uh, the, um, here we go again, the Egyptian cotton linen uh, thread count, okay? And, uh, and I think that is really what we um, at Volvo Dance are gonna sort of, um, I don't like the word sell, but that is the experience. And, and it is to, to really bring people closer to the concept of a sustainable business. And um, obviously you weave that into the guest experience. One of our um, signature experience even before COVID, but even more so after COVID is what we call the heart and home village tour where we take our guests to the back of house and really completely transparently share uh, how things work ranging from energy to water to waste very important wastewater workshops uh, our desert academy and um, it's, a, it's a really very fascinating to see how people how much they take along from such a journey of su such a tour and I think in many cases apart from the beautiful photos they take, that's probably the highlight or their, you know, what makes us stand apart from, from, from our, you know, friends and competitors. So that's, that's sort of how I see where we are headed. And one very key aspect, and we heard it before, is, is collaboration and, and transparency and sharing of knowledge. And uh, when, if you go, if you Google the Arid Eden project, you will find a, a beautiful web page. And the idea is really to, to share whatever we do with, with anybody who's interested and to sort of maybe provide a blueprint for people uh, to go about their business in a more sustainable way. And, and I can just say that long run has helped us tremendously to bring structure into our insustainability, which we have done intuitively in the past, but now it's, it's very focused, it's very organized and um, I think uh, measurable to an extent and yeah. So um, it's changing, that's me. Wonderful, thank you so much. So Russell, over to you now. Thanks, Brooke, <clears throat> and good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, yeah, just listening to Louise and Stefan, I think is just inspired by the journeys that you you know you've been on with the the long run. And I think as Brooke mentioned earlier, you know Swalu is the the absolute newbie. We joined last year, uh, a proud fellow member last year, and <clears throat> you know for a long time what we want to do is look for a partner with an organization just setting kind of best practice standards in sustainable management and and almost the science behind sustainability and for us you know the, the journey is new i think it starts with this this commitment um and thereafter there's this assessment and i think for swalu what is i think what is so important for us is that it's not necessarily a stamp of approval, but this authentic, sustainable journey that is almost infinite. It's never ending. You know, you you kind of benchmarking yourself on on a daily basis, <clears throat> and I think that's one of the reasons why it was important for us to become a fellow member. Um, our purpose, as you can see, is to restore, conserve, and enhance the ecology of Swalu and promoting the cultural and historical heritage. And that's so closely aligned, I think, with what the, what the four C's represents. Um, and I think for us as well, it's about the, the collaboration. It's an incredible community. I mean, you've just heard two most amazing stories that to draw on that knowledge, that wealth, that expertise. Um, it's this objective evaluation 
And I think it just it just contributes and helps us in becoming kind of more aware of the sustainability and how we impact our communities. I think if, we, if you break it down and we look at those four C's, you know, Swalu first and foremost is a conservation project. Um, the whole ambition was to restore this region of the Southern Kalahari that was previously desecrated by, by farming. Um, and what has happened over the years, we've had this amalgamation of about 45 farms and just allowing mother nature, time and space to restore this protected area. We're now sitting at just under 300,000 acres and home to a number of rare and endangered species. And what is crucial, I think, to the Swalu story is Again, the science behind the, the conservation. In 2008, we started the Swalu Foundation um, to support ecological research on the, on the reserve. And the three primary components were the biodiversity con conservation, uh, climate change, and then the anthropogenic component where, you know, if you look at that part of the world with the sand and the history is understanding the human impact past, present, and future. <clears throat> and what makes Swalu so intriguing is that guests that arrive at Swalu get to understand that region of where it was, what we're aspiring to, and you know the type of experience, and also being able to interact with, with researchers on the ground. You know, that Southern Kalahari area is such an undiscovered wilderness. Um, and home to an incredibly diverse uh, species, um, just the flora and fauna, and guests have the opportunity to, to interact on a daily basis with researchers on the ground. Um, one of the key projects at the moment we have is the Kalahari Endangered Ecosystem Project, which looks at the impact of climate change on a variety of species. And as I said, you know, you, you have your guests experiencing something on the ground where they're interacting with, with, with researchers and typically understanding what are we what we are trying to, to achieve. As far as the community is concerned, you know, Swalu's community, if you look at the just by virtue of the location, um, extremely isolated. We other than our incredible staff, you know, our community extends beyond our, our boundaries. It's, it's families, it's the, the researchers that are at Swalu on a regular basis. Um, we have the most incredible clinic on the property where we have visiting doctors and dentists. Um, literally every supplier, you know, we, we focus on the more the artisan suppliers within the region um, and some of the, the most incredible product within a fairly close radius of the, of the reserve. And so again, for us, part and parcel of the balance is for guests to understand what the community is all about and to immerse themselves in, in those experiences. Um, we've got a, a wonderful school on the, on the reserve and you know, if you look at the location, um, limited access to education facilities. So, from an adult point of view, we have these um, base, ad adult basic education training. Um, so, certainly, an upliftment of the community that's so crucial to our conservation ambitions. From a from a cultural point of view. You know, we, we've come from Middle Stone Age where we had this the sand that where the purpose was this, this low impact and just to kind of natural preservation. And that's our ambition. The ambition of Swalu has been the restoration of the Southern Kalahari and our creed to leave the world better than how we found it. And if you look at our logo, you can see it's the um, it's the shape of a shape of a tree, the petroglyph that's emanated from the, from the region, and that the tree itself talks to sustainability, longevity, shelter,
protection, and that's certainly part of, of our heritage. When it comes to, I suppose the commercial side is a sustainable ecotourism model is essential. And you know, Swalu has always offered this low impact kind of high value guest experience where you're typically experiencing conservation, the community culture over a three or four day period. You know, I think Louise alluded to it earlier. I think gone are the days of a, you know, a two safaris a day, spending the rest of the time in your, you know, in camp. And Stefan having that 400 gram Egyptian cotton, you know, what guests want to do now is they really want to immerse themselves in the experience, immerse themselves in the, in the property, the products. And I think that's exceptionally important for a sustainable ecotourism model, that guests get to understand why you're doing what you're doing, that you have this incredible safari experience, but you can also interact with the, the research component understanding the science behind conservation. You get to, you get to experience the, you know, we have these most incredible walks where you can go and just learn, you know, the sand, you look at these etchings that just date back to middle stone age, where you really get to understand your roots and, and where you're coming from. And I suppose over and above that, you do get, you know, coupled with the incredible food, the wonderful camp experience, but you get to understand, you know, the community, and I think immerse yourself in this in this wonderful this journey. And I think for for us, it's important. And again, for guests, that you you, know, you 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 I don't think you can be this concerned observer anymore. You know, you you have to be an active contributor. And I think for us, it's key that every guest that comes to Swalu understands that they're contributing to the sustainability of this protected area. I think on that note, I will end and we'll hand it over to you, Brooke. Thanks very much, Russell. Um, well, as we start to wait for questions to come in um, beforehand, we were all talking about a fellow member, which is uh, Sao Tome and Principe which is a very far flung destination. And remember the long run has member partners all over the world. And many of those are in very far flung destinations. We were also talking about, I keep hearing the word rigorous, the process that it takes to get into the long run, to become a global ecosphere retreat. Um, Delphine told me actually that there's a property in process for that and it's taking upwards of a year still. So my question for Louise, for Stefan, for Russell is, do you have a story or a memory of maybe what the hardest thing was for you to accomplish to finally get over um, the line? I mean, because this is a rigorous process and it does take time and there's a lot that you need to actually showcase. What was the most challenging? No one wants to answer me. <laughs> uh, I, th I think Please. for, yeah. I think for us, you know, we've, as I say, I think first and foremost is there's this, this commitment. And, you know, typically the process is you would have this baseline assessment. Um, and then, you, then you're benchmarking yourself. You know, the, that line that you talk about, I think, is, is ever evolving. It moves. You know, you, you're kind of pushing yourself and you, you're trying to improve what you're doing on a, on a daily basis. So, I think, I think from a Swalu perspective is we also have to, you, you've got to manage it in bite-sized chunks too. You know, I think if you look at this in, in, in entire vision and this entire purpose, I think it can be quite intimidating. So you've got to take it in small chunks. You've got to address certain areas that are probably potentially a little more urgent than others and just keep working towards that, that end goal, which kind of seems infinite. Um, for Koshas, it was supporting the community uh, in their journey of land management. So around us, there's 100,000 acres, there's 6,000 families in that area. And in that journey, we had to find ways to support them, get their rights to their land. 
and within that advocate and see if there was buy-in for land to be used by the community for conservation. And so there, th this was a 10 year process um, that affected 6,000 families uh, and has been achieved. Um, so there's components like that. There's components around supporting our team in, in looking at the medicinal uses of plants and, and getting that message out why they're important. There, there was a documentary done by on, on one of our staff who's one of the last Il Turobo tribe members on medicinal plants that's now been seen by 9 million YouTube viewers. Some of that won't be relevant to us for decades, but it is still important. And it's an important part of the work that we do. There may be, there is no commercial benefit for us, but it's still incredibly important for the context. Do I have to say something? Well, unless it was all just an easy breeze for you. <laughs> No, I think the, the most challenging part for me personally as the driver of Volver Dance was to, um, you know, first of all, grasp the intellectual concept of the four C's and then, um, you know, start operating in a more structured way and not just taking decisions from the gut, which I must say before we come a, became a long run member served us quite well, you know, we intuitively did things right. But the long run helped us to bring structure into it, and um, and the other the other challenge I found um, was actually to ingrain the concept of the long run and the four C's into into your team, you know, and and get get them to swallow it, spoon fed, slowly, slowly, one step at a time, and. Um, and that I must say is 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 now actually it's it's not discussed anymore. Where initially when we started this journey of sustainability, which inevitably costs money, um, if you want to do real impactful things, that money obviously eats into, for instance, management incentives. And um, you know, I found that quite quite a challenge, which is why I found a wonderful solution and that was to, um, in, in addition to a conservation levy, which had been charged for our guests as a um, extra line item for 20 years, uh, we just introduced a foundation levy um, and that foundation levy gave the foundation incredible income, um, money for jam, and uh, that money could be spent to do a whole of a lot of really amazing things that no normal tourism operation would would do, you know. So you you um, you find ways around challenges, and um, otherwise, I don't think it's a challenge. Um, it's it's just a wonderful journey. It's fun, and uh, maybe we had it a little bit easier because we were a founding member. <laughs> so Russell, <laughs> early bird that catches the worm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> can, can I add to this? Of course. Because I, exactly, I think, you know, basically within my, what we did to create this blueprint was really take the best practice, you know, the, the, the nine founding members were quite already uh, far in their journeys. And, and what we did was really look at their strength and use their strength. E you know, each one had a particular strength and that's what we used as a, as a benchmark to create the four C's. Um, and, and then what I, I, for me, you know, because Stefan, just to jump off a bit of Stefan, I think what a lot of members find valuable in the four C's, so the four C's seems to be that uh, convoluted kind of framework, but it, it isn't, it actually breaks down in bites what is it that would be useful to consider if you want to be there for 100 years in the landscape that you would like to have with the uh, collaboration and relationship that you would like to have uh, with the community around you, um, with, the, with their future and the kind of, an, a kind of economy that you would like to, to, to foster. So I think what the four C, you know, a lot of the work that we do as the team uh, is, is try to 
help members think strategically around the four C's. So when it's about creating structure, but it, but a bit more in a strategic way, as a lot of members, when they come in the long run, they do already, they have to show that they're committed. So beyond commitment, they have to show, you know, proof in, on the ground, not necessarily be at the Volvidence, not, not at the GR level, but at least show the commitment and the commitment has to show on the ground. But often what they struggle with is, Pick, pick the wins, you know, what is it that is going to take them to, to, to the goals that they set themselves and often they haven't set the goals. So often they haven't set their conservation community, they, they have their business plan, they have a conservation project, usually, um, and, and then they're trying to make things work. And, I, and, you know, gut, of course, gut is the best, you know, best uh, instinct is the best way to start. But when they start to be so many balls in the air, which one do you pick to get you where you want to go? And have you defined where is it that you want to go? And I think that's what the four C's gives um, uh, to a lot of members that struggle at the beginning to say, okay, where do we start? Quick follow on question to that before I get to some of the ones that are coming in um, from our participants, which are great. Um, so this might come across as kind of a cerebral conversation for those of us on the inside. And what we're trying to do as this is a talking point that consumers are really more interested in now, we're seeing all of these other organizations pop up that say, we do the same thing. And we've all obviously, you know, use the word greenwashing in the past, um, at least in terms of what some people might do. Is there an easy way to break down what we're talking about here and make it very digestible for the consumer so that they understand why the long run is the standard, the gold standard, like why it is so challenging for members to participate and, and you know, why that stands apart from, say, some of the other numerous sustainable consortiums that are popping up now that this is what everyone's talking about. Delphine, <laughs> unless anyone else wants to. Sorry, la, la, I, I thought Louise wanted to jump on that. Oh, um, so, <laughs> no. oh like so, okay, I think we've been 10 years at it to be honest, um, and uh, we can show impact, but mainly it's about be, you know, walking the talk. And, and I think more and more as people uh, get interested and get aware, it's about, you know, the, why is the 4C so powerful? Because it's a way also for people to, to engage in, in the sustainability discussion and look at how, how does it translate on the ground? So it's all about your experience in the ground and, and your way to, you know, to positively impact what's happening in the destination where you're going. So I think just look, you know, for, for people um, who even on the surface, just to look when they want to go somewhere, just to look at what, what is it that people are doing. But why the long run is standing apart is just <laughs> the requirement on the membership is quite strong, it's, it's quite difficult to get into. So again, I was talking about the commitment, but also showcasing what is it that you're doing on the ground. And again, we, we went from targeting members who are really, uh, there in terms of their journey, their practices, to actually opening to people who were more earlier in, in their journey so that we could have more impact because uh, so that we helped, you know, that first hurdle, we want to do things right, but we didn't know how to start. But even if you're at the beginning, as Russell knows, uh, well, they were not at the beginning, but, you know, as Russell knows, there's, there's a lot of uh, interaction with the team. So what we're looking for here is commitment, demonstration of, of impact on the ground, uh, looking at the vision, you know, is the vision aligned with what, what the long run is, but also the kind of passion, you know, I think there's a, however we're doing it, four C's, journeys, support, etc. there's one thing that unites everyone is the passion for the landscape, is the passion for the people in that landscape, is the passion to drive uh, impact. And I think that we have to feel it when we when we um, when we interact with potential members, and then the final thing is the desire to share and to learn. 
Uh, and and you know this is the biggest one of the biggest value of the of the long run to members is this exchange, this accelerated learning, this innovative thinking. You know that's just by being together. And I think um, Louise was talking about it, this competition to do better, but to do better in terms of sustainability, we're talking here, you know, people are challenging themselves, you know, oh, well, I thought I was doing well in this area, but, uh, you know, so and so in Brazil is doing much better. How can I top that? And I think that's the, the real excitement about what we created in that, you know, what's what this community has created by being open, but sharing these, these best practice. So in terms of us setting apart, I think every member here is set to, to leave a legacy, to take Louise's words. Um, and we have the science and, and measuring, you know, we're measuring impact. So, we can talk into in depth. Um, may I add something to that? I think what is also very important, seeing that we are now that our audience is two operators. You know, I think not one long runner has up to now it might change and hopefully will change post COVID, but not one of us has now until now seen one extra bum in bed um, because we joined the long run and we've got a stamp of approval. I think everybody who's part of the long run really does it out of a deep, um, deep um, uh, longing to, 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 you know, run your business in a different way. And that's, that's really what the long run gives us. It's a, it's a, it's a community and it actually has got nothing to do with, with running a, you know, running a profitable business. It's, it's something you do from the heart because you want to do the right thing. And, um, and I think that's, that's the spirit of the long run. It's really good. And uh, maybe one day the bed nights will follow. Thanks to you. If you, we manage to convince you tonight. <laughs> I think both of those points actually lead perfectly into a conversation because it is talking about the long run community and partnership. So I'll just read this um, verbatim. I wonder what partner membership looks like from a tour operator perspective. What are some of the goals that tour operators are working toward as a long run partner? And how can we work with our guests through this framework to help guests play a more active role in conservation while traveling? Okay, I'll take that one. Um, um, so that's a brilliant question. And we're, we're at the beginning of this journey. Um, so we've launched this membership, uh, this partnership uh, last year uh, in response to demand and also to realizing that, as I said before, you know, that if we want tourism to deliver its promise and, and the, the movement to grow and the great work that our members are doing, you know, to inspire others and transform transform travelers um, you know the limpspin is tra travel partners and what we you know and and what we're doing with travel partners is really starting to design a journey so on the basis of the four C's and the journeys that we've that we've engaged with uh, with the fellow members we're designing one for travel partners and in in uh, collaboration with travel partners so basically we are adapting the force. The four C's is a concept that can be adaptable to any business. I mean, really, and, and that should be taken on by any business. I mean, it's, you know, people, planet, profit, what culture. Uh, I think it's, it's essential for any business nowadays. Um, but so, you know, what we're trying to, trying to transfer, how to plan strategically, you know, looking at the strength of, of travel partners, I think your strength is to influence. You can influence the guest and you can influence your suppliers. So you're, you're in a great position um, uh, to have really huge impacts, but you also have a huge responsibility, A, to commit to create impact, to look at what kind of impact you, you want to create, but also to look at yourselves. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of pushback often from suppliers saying, well, you know, I, I, often tour operators or travel agent demand things from us, but they didn't necessarily look at themselves. So the journey is looking at 
you know, the four C's within us, which is because we haven't explained too much what the four C's include, but it's that, you know, looking in, so mitigating our, uh, our you know, mitigating our negative impact, so environmental management, um, uh, you know, stimulating workplace, etc. And then it's looking out what's what is it that we want to achieve in terms of conservation and how we're going to achieve this. And in your case, it's really about raising awareness of guests on how to engage, where to engage, uh, raising their interest in in you know having a positive impact. And to be honest, they're ready. <laughs> they're really ready. I mean, in view of the stats that uh, you know I was presenting yesterday, I think eighty percent of travelers from from two studies, one Euromonitor and one Booking.com. They, you know, 80% of travelers are looking for sustainable option, sustainability option. And I think 57% or something are really annoyed when they don't have, you know, it's not clear. It's not, um, it's not always easy to make that choice. You know, I want to, to look at sustainability, but I don't know how to do it. Again, tour operators, travel agents, designers have a huge opportunity to start engaging in that discussion. And then it's about looking at the suppliers, who is doing the good stuff. Um, and the full C's can help in that. So another thing that we're doing is developing a screening, a screening tool for, for, uh, for, for travel partners. I think maybe that was not very brief, but. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Stephanie. <laughs> we have another wonderful question, unless anybody wants to add on to that. So this is another one that I'm gonna just read. Can the long run consortium help each other financially to buffer down years like we're experiencing now? Could there be some form of insurance premium that you all pay annually to help each other during pandemics, election cycle years? I ask because the 4C impact is so great but requires a viable business to sustain. Could insurance help? I think that's a wonderful question. I wish Stefan and Russell could help cut us out every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on, on a more serious note, um, you know, part of being a long run member is looking at financial sustainability, not just conservation sustainability. And, and you know, that was a critical part. So for Codders, we increased our reserves and when tourism stopped, had to find creative ways to fund sustainability, which we have managed to do. I haven't seen really an insurance policy that helps pay for conservation when businesses fail. I mean, I think there's a real opportunity for that, um, but I haven't seen it really evolve yet in the marketplace. Thank you, Louise. Delphine, you look like you're gonna say something. Now, I thought Stefan was going to say something, but I will say something if, if he do, you don't. I, yeah, I think that's a great question and it's something that we've been working on, not, not you know, looking at for privately protected areas. You know, this is a big discussion on how do we, you know, tourism, interestingly, was a way to diversify from doing a funder, funded conservation. So it has been hugely successful and I want to put that. Uh, on the table because it was a diversification already. Uh, but the, you know, COVID taught us never put your eggs in, you know, all your eggs in the same basket. And, and what, what has been interesting is that throughout the pandemic, all our members have found support for their conservation activities, whether from their own business or from their guests. And what we're doing at the long run is trying to find opportunities for, you know, opportunities for supporting for, uh, for donor support. So we we kind of try to, um, uh, how do you call it, compound, you know, fundraising calls. Um, I think we we endorse fund, fundraising campaigns just to give credibility and we're looking at designing an internal kind of donation scheme which hopefully uh, uh, will help in, in, in crisis. Stefan did you want to add something? Um, no look I think um, I'm done with insurance uh, never works really um, and I think the best insurance as Delphine said, is is uh, lying in diversity, um, and we we actually had a very interesting experience in the last twelve months because what 
what kept us alive was our um, quite extensive vocational training center, um, which just carried on because it's not funded by tourism, it's funded through, you know, donations and government agency and so on. And, and that really kept the wheel spinning. If it hadn't been for that, we would have been in a really deep, dark, depressing hole. And, um, and I think that was a perfect affirmation to, as Delphine says, you know, have different eggs to put in different baskets. And that's where we, which is uh, not a revolutionary new idea, but it's a, it's a no brainer that um, you should go for instance, into food production, you know, um, because when the next crisis hits, people have to eat. So I think that's your insurance. And also in terms of the individual, because that's on a corporate level, uh, in terms of the individual level, um, that's also something we want to take along from this time is to, to seriously and proactively encourage every single team member to carve for themselves a, a second leg to stand on, whether they provide services, whether they, you know, do manufacture something from garden furniture to bee hives to solar cookers, or they, you know, they do handicraft, uh, something that, um, you know, gives them an alternative leg to stand on. And I think that's, that's uh, much more practical and doable than uh, banking on insurance companies to pay business interruption, which is a big battle uh, we are fighting globally. So um, yeah, so much for insurance or preparing for the next, uh, the next wave. Well, and with that, we have come to an hour and I currently don't have any more questions. So I will turn it back over to the four of you. If you have any just final comments that you would like to make, we'll see if any other questions come in in that time. Um, so I'll turn it over to you and just say again, thank you very much for your time today. And then for everyone who has joined us as well. Uh, just thank you to everyone listening in today. Um, you know, we would not have clients if it were not for your support. And, and this is a collaborative journey. We can't do it alone. And we really hope that moving forward, uh, tour operators will step more into the space of looking at uh, initiatives and partners that, that are genuinely supporting sustainability. So thank you so much for your time today. All right, so I think that's it. Um, again, everyone, thank you so much for your time. And I am going to...